Hello, everybody, and welcome to our podcast. I am Hans Johansson, and together I have Kalle Lundahl, and joining us also is Henrik Gustafsson. And today we're going to discuss a philosophical word and its uh, uh, say implications. And that word is apeiron. Uh, this has been inspired by an article uh, of the philosopher Stephen M. Rosen. Stephen M. Rosen. And he takes the expression apeiron from uh, the Greek philosopher Anaximander. It is actually the oldest, oldest philosophical expression we have. And it has been preserved on a piece of parchment. Uh, what does then uh, this apeiron means? One could say it's the unbounded, the things that we do not understand, the limitless. That is the things that are beyond uh, our usual understanding, so to speak. Uh, an open field one can compare it to. And in this article, uh, especially, but in different places, uh, Stephen M. Rose, Rosen means that there has been a history uh, in the Western development of thinking that has been trying to avoid uh, the apeiron. One, to, one tries to shy it off by limiting things, uh, human borders, humans, human bonds and limits. And uh, the first one is without a doubt the one that already developed during pre-Socratic time. And that is usually called uh, an object in a receptacle as Plato would have had it, but you can just say an object. Uh, in space in front of a subject. So after that, everything sort of slid into this format. That was the boundedness of uh, reality, uh, a way of shying off uh, that that wasn't bounded. And uh, Stephen M. Rosen, he follows this development of trying to shy off the apparel but the apeiron persists in coming back all the time. It makes its presence known and uh, we make new tries in trying to shy it off. Um, the last three examples uh, are Einstein. Uh, his general relativity was a consequence of apeiron made its face shown. Uh, it was the collapse of the regular three-dimensional space, it didn't work anymore. And uh, Einstein took the message from Apeiron, but he instilled a fourth dimension, the space-time. And then he once more warded off the Apeiron from appearing. But already when, when he was in the process of doing this, he understood somewhere, if something is going to be too heavy in my scheme, there could actually be collapse of the whole project. So he suspected that. He suspected that the singularity could disrupt his general uh, relativity. And it did. And we all know what they are called today. They are called black holes. When you get too much mass, uh, Einsteinian vision of boundedness collapses into a hole actually, <laughs> which is, this is rather great because Stephen M. Rosen makes this uh, sort of uh, ambigram where you can read whole two ways with a double uh, U and just the H. And that of course signifies whole as everything and whole emptiness. Uh, two times were uh, made by their parent to make its appearance. The second time was quantum physics. Once more, it was warded off. We found something stable, some boundary, and that became the graviton in quantum physics. 
And then the third time he mentions a very interesting string theory and that the apeiron is shoved, shoved, shoved off uh, with the help of dimensions that sort of ward off the apeiron, the boundless, the limitless. Uh, and what Stephen Ambrosian actually means is real borders, not man-made borders, actually comes from the apeiron. So apeiron is both limitless and making our borders, whereas all the other borders are subjective and made by the subject. They are, uh, in a sense, very humane, even too much, uh, because they get dis the distort reality in some way or try to bind it, one could say, just. Uh, and I think uh, that is a very short resume of what uh, uh, Stephen M. Rosen is writing in his paper about the payroll. Uh, any first thought, uh, thoughts, direct thoughts about this? Yes, well, isn't it also that a payroll shows up in uh, postmodern culture? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Somehow that there are only perspectives and stuff and no real borders. Yeah, yeah, it's true. He, he mentioned that a payroll is shoved off in modernism. The, the epoch we just had before, and he shows examples both from, as I mentioned, on physics, but also art, literature, uh, where it's uh, sort of, we try to bound the things. And he said, uh, this painting uh, of Picasso, where you can see all sides of the face could actually be uh, the artistic expression of the boundedness to show off uh, the limitless, the unbound, because then you can see both the front and the back at the same time, and thereby you don't have anything that is not bounded or decided. <laughs> so, <laughs> that of course collapses in postmodernism, where uh, uh, because of this boundedness, uh, we give up the project of trying to uh, understand reality or approach reality. But at the same time, in this movement of postmodernism, actually the boundedness is uh, enforced even more, just became, becomes even smaller, and even more bounded, more narrow, more limiting and all that. And of course, John Searle, uh, who got a book from Darida, called Limited Incorporated, is just that. It's a person that limits a little bit too much. And uh, one could actually say that uh, Darida was helping the payroll <laughs> mm. <laughs> in a way. Uh, yes, but what does this concept payroll really resolve? Uh, if you think in dualistic terms, that, um, the opposite of apeiron is peiro, that is limit. So, mm. so, uh, so, so you have uh, you don't uh, get you don't get rid of the dualism because of uh, or thanks to apeiron. Uh, so, uh, what is really the point of apeiron? Because you don't get rid of the dualism. Uh, I don't think uh, there is a point actually. Uh... He just wants to show this tendency that is interesting in itself of trying to bind, try to limit, uh, at least in the article of Apeiron, I didn't get the the impression he, the Apeiron had purpose of that. Uh, I actually uh, found the article here and... Uh, ah, did you know? This um, Apeiron embodies the ambiguity at our core that must be brought to light and consciously processed if we are to attain fulfillment as human beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Only by setting aside all the categorical isms, dualism, reductionism, idealism, etc., and consciously holding the paradox of a payron, can the whole person gain concrete realization. Mm -hmm. Well, it's from the individual's perspective, then. Uh, we can, on an individual point of view, uh, and 
sort of embrace the bounded less uh, and become more whole, uh, not having to split ourselves in dualities or uh, limit ourselves. Well, uh, maybe it's better to see it limit ourselves with these boundaries, uh, these uh, limits that are actually man-made. Yeah, and uh, the paradoxes occur then. We have paradoxes yeah. that we fa need to face then because we have yeah. got these limits. limits. Yeah, it, this is somewhat uh, uh, similar of the uh, division between ontological and ontic because uh, the paradoxes are ontological. They are in reality. So we don't invent the paradoxes. It's not from our thinking firsthand. It's from reality. And that's uh, actually uh, not uh, how people usually reason about that. When we say we have a thinking paradox, we say we need to solve that somehow. That what Einstein thought, and that what they thought when, with the Copenhagen interpretation, and definitely that's the thinking behind string theory. Uh, we need to solve this. We need to have a solution, and the solution is the new boundedness. Uh, uh, this is our striving to regulate, to master, to 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 put into a box or something like that. Yeah. So whole apparent is an ambiguity. Apparent is the is a great paradox or something. Well, yeah, it seems that way. It's, it's a great paradox. It's uh, what uh, maybe uh, if I can make up a definition, what we have not been able to bind or bound from a human perspective, like philosophers, scientists, and artists, and whatnot what lies beyond, so to speak. But at the same time, you said in the beginning that he is the setting of boundaries also. Yeah, oddly also. enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, true boundaries that are not human set. The boundaries we need. Uh, one could see the boundaries that Einstein put up or Newton put up. They are sort of proxies. They are ersatz, they are surrogates. But the true barriers are paradoxical in nature. And we try to keep our uh, boundaries non-ambiguous, non-dual, and monosemit, uh, monos, uh, monosemitical, <laughs> whatever the word is, uh, with only one meaning. And this striving uh, puts us in, in, uh, in a perpetual motion, motion between the things that we want to rid, because as human beings made these the divisions, but the thing is they cannot be upheld. It's human inventions. And therefore, they always depend on the thing they want to cast out, uh, the negative space, the marginalized part. The thing that we don't want to talk about, the thing everything is depending on. Mm. So I think what you said about Einstein, he invented the fourth dimension to push the boundaries. And I take that as a parallel also to uh, Kleinbottle because Kleinbottle itself is a paradox of the inside outside. Yeah. But we set up the boundary and say, okay, this is the fourth dimension, dimensional piece then. And in doing so, we, we set up a boundary. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, the four dimensions of uh, uh, Einstein are, uh, that's the space time. So they are actually drawn, you can actually draw them. Whereas the fourth, fourth dimension of uh, uh, the Klein bottle is is undrawable. It's 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 see that's impossible. Uh, one should note that uh, the time in Einstein is also a boundary in some way. Uh, it's it's more reasonable to think of time as something as well, at least with, with three dimensions. Uh, whereas the time in Einstein is just one line. 
It doesn't have dimensionality, it doesn't have depth. And that in itself is uh, not in the Klein bottle. The Klein bottle time, at least in our perspective from three dimensions, the time in Klein bottle is three dimensional. And uh, uh, that opens up, up a bit more, a lot more, I would say. Uh, of course, there is a boundedness also in this, but it's a way of uh, maybe loosening up some other boundaries. Uh, I think the most important here is the Einsteinian time is just a line. It's really weird. It's, it doesn't have dimensionality. Uh, in a way, it's uh, he tries to get rid of a problem as a parent turning up, making paradoxes before pre-Einsteinian physics had a problem, and then he solved it, but he just sort of shoved the problem somewhere else where it was too complicated to, to calculate, to understand. But already in Einstein's own lifetime, he suspected the singularity. And of course, uh, when it finally came, uh, it was a disaster for his project. And that, I think, this is me putting the words into Stephen M. Rose's mouth. But it could be, he wants to show, you can never get rid of the apparel. It uh, doesn't matter how hard you try. It's, uh, uh, it's a human endeavor to bound. And all human endeavor to bound, to sort of tame the untamable, will erupt in this problem. I think that could be his point. I'm not sure, though. Yes, so, so I, I think that we should not, so to say to do two mistakes when we use apparent one is that to place it in a in a otherworldly dimension like no. in the platonic uh, mm. platonic word or yeah, uh, mm -hmm. or to no but what um anyhow we have to so to say have, have our body as a point of departure and yeah. when we put, when we speak about payron or apparent um, what is our body? Uh, it, it, it might have two limits. One is the physica, perhaps, that we see, but then we have also the uh, body of Leonardo Vinci, the mm. Leonardian man, so it is, uh, our, that is the second point. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit longer, but in reality, it's really the body is apparent. It is without limits yeah, because yeah, okay. we are all connected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, but, but the thing is that how, how, we, how can we apply to our everyday, everyday lives the concept of apparent? Yeah, good question. <laughs> I agree. Good question. It's very interesting. It's like the body, maybe. I'm just going to throw some ideas in here since we're speaking to Tia Cousin yesterday. Uh, I have to inform the public here. We met an Indian yesterday. We mentioned that in the former podcast, I think, just. He's a Lakota Indian, and we had a Zoom meeting with him. And he mentions the solution could be actually going into verbs, action. And what is the body if not action? It does thing. It's verb-oriented. Yeah, it's verb-oriented. And remember that departure of the reflective consciousness. It used to be, consciousness used to be in the body, somewhere in the body, but then it moved up to a transcendental I, and it became this subject before object in space. And he moved up to the head, but it wasn't literally in the head, it was somewhere else, nowhere. <laughs> transcendental I. And maybe to get the consciousness down to the body again as action or verb, action, action device. The action could be the solution, could be the key. Hmm. That could be a little bit like Alexander technique, learn to do the actions in the right order with direction, with energy uh, in the right. The spine comes first extending and thereby helping the rest of the movement and uh, probably one can assume the Greek had a first hint of misuse somewhere that were not using their bo bodies in the, in the outmost best way 
So, and their emotions as well. Uh, maybe there was a trauma somewhere, slight in the beginning, not noticeable, but it began there somehow, some break. Uh, and then because we got traumatized, we needed to heal that break. We went the wrong way. Uh, we started to have boundaries. Uh, it sounds a little bit neurotic. <laughs> you, <laughs> neurotical light. <laughs> mm -hmm. Neurotic people need a lot of borders and they need everything to be specified. They don't like spontaneity. Uh, it's, uh, everything is very limited with neurotic people because they feel unsafe uh, and they get even more unsafe than with normal people who are already unsafe. And therefore they need even more borders, more limits. Uh, but uh, I don't know if it's safe to say, but it could be that a parent is actually the true home. That is where everything gets resolved. And that's why we find the energy and the true borders are not human made, not inventions, but we can use them and uh, make our lives fruitful. Uh, I assume. So uh, I, I get the message to be like, we, we shouldn't, as, an, as man's, man, man shouldn't set up borders uh, somehow, uh, instead continue exploring, continue with the action or something, or continue the project or continue with the creativity until uh, either some paradox occur or something naturally happens that we find mm. border in some kind of natural way where a payron sets the border instead. Mm. Uh, that's what I get out of it, um, not to be too uh, narrow and uh, set up the borders too early or something. Yeah, too in early. Whatever, whatever you are into, I mean. Yeah, yeah, too early and too hard, I would say. So they need to be uh, lightened up a bit because they, it's very cramped. It's very clampact. It's also very sweet. It's it's this neurotic feeling. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with using borders, not at all, uh, as long as they're not very, very hardly cast and unmovable or unchangeable, being part of reality. Well, a little bit like uh, the French philosophers, they, they went in to look into reality. They want to perceive reality. And what they perceived was that everything is defined, everything is determined. They were actually looking into their own borders. They thought they were real. So borders are okay maybe as a helping tool, but these people actually thought they were real uh, and they weren't, they weren't even scientists because it was already established in, in uh, everyday language by then, the mid 18th century. So they went out to look at reality, what they saw were borders. They thought those borders come from nature. No, mm -hmm. they came from man. As long as we know they are from us, they are okay. But as long as we, like Einstein says, time space is real. That's what he said. He said, this is too good. <laughs> he did actually say that. Uh, I don't remember the quote exactly. But what he said, this is too true not to be the real world. And then he made a mistake. It every fitted his mathematics and everything. And he actually said that. Uh, God well, so, uh, so how do you know it's a true border from a payroll? I mean, um, how do you distinguish that? Uh, I'd, say, I, I'd say here, here, here it is a payroll and, and we have this paradox mm. border or something done. Uh, the paradox occurs here and we need to stop here or something. Par I, I, um, yeah, I'd say like Kalle said, it's when in this, in this it's when it's in the body, when the body is uh, relaxed, balanced, coordinated, and the borders are not too tough, uh, when they're not too limiting, uh, when they are uh, more like helping tools that we need to have, but they are not unchangeable, they're not completely fixed. It's a little bit like left hemisphere and right hemisphere, or the right hemisphere, Let's assume the right hemisphere makes borders, but its borders are more, uh, how could you say, uh, not as defined. They're, they're more usable in the real life because too, uh, too hard borders make the body not work well, I'd say. That's a horrible sentence. But uh, if the borders get too hard, you get cramped. You can't move about. So uh, the bordering needs to be loosened up a bit, be uh, flexible. 
But, but mm -hmm. I mean, Aperon shows the border. You said uh, he 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 is the board, the true board make board maker one. <laughs> uh, um, Aperon yeah, shows, shows mm -hmm. us the border, right? Hmm. I would say like this. So uh, now I try to imagine I'm Anaximander. So yeah. he 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 thought that uh, so that Aperon is like the thing that gives birth to everything. So uh, from Apero, you um, uh, you have uh, dualists like wet and uh, hot and all that etc. So so Apero is a kind of egg that gives birth to all oh, dualists. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so so. In if I try to interpret Aperon uh, like Anaximander would have thought it was, I would say it was like a dead space for him. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so for the Greeks, as we have many uh, many times said, uh, empty space was something horrible for the Greeks. Oh yeah. So 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 uh, Aperon, okay, it, it's uh, Anaximander doesn't define it, but it's something boundless that is. Mm space empty space that is horrible but mm. it's also something that doesn't have any purpose mm -hmm. therefore from this space that doesn't have any purpose that this limited space that doesn't have any purpose he mm. has to create something like dualism oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so this is my interpretation of anaximander and and um, yeah um so so we, we could say that for anaximander appears like an egg uh, from which uh, there comes everything in the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it sounds very true, actually. Yeah, so well done. <laughs> it sounds very true. Uh, uh, and and uh, thinking of the borders, maybe the Apparel's borders are borders are looser and not as uh, fixed in some way. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so far, Naximan, there, uh, everything is. Static, static. Yeah, static, static. Yes, that's uh, the word. The, 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 the space, space is uh, fluid, dead, mm -hmm. more or less implicitly dead. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to create something. Uh, and for Anaximander, uh, certainly Apera was some kind of essence, a dead mm -hmm. materia, even yeah, though yeah. he calls it limitless, because space for him that they couldn't see it was limitless, yeah, but it was yeah. also dangerous. So they had to limit it in the yeah, same, yeah. In the same. Uh, so, so he, so to say, deconstructs himself, Anaximander, in the same uh, time that he creates uh, something um, uh, limitless, he also uh, de uh, destroys it because it's yeah. something dangerous for him, the, the, yeah. the limitless. Oh, wow, very good, yeah. How interesting. So is, uh, I would say Apeiro for Anaximander is like another variant of uh, Plato's, the Platonic idea, idea of uh, the Platonic world. Uh, yeah. It's, it's only flawed in there, uh, like um, empty space. Okay, Plato fills it with uh, his ideas, uh, mm. but it's still um, so some, something. Uh, Anaximander didn't have the imagination yet to create. No, no, no. It came later, yeah. Uh, but, but you have still the, um, so to say, the seed there. Aperon is the platonic, the first version of the platonic idea world. And, yeah. Uh, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Huh. Hmm. Not half bad. Hmm. But of course, we can use Aperon another way. We can use it, uh, Aperon, as uh, starting, uh, starting point from our bodies. Uh, that, that we should uh, try to, 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 to reach the... Uh, the limitless with our bodies, we shouldn't put borders uh, to our bodies. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> no, they become uh, inflexible and hard to move about, and uh, the body seems to encompass both uh, black and white, as uh, one could say, uh, both the negative and the positive, both space and not space. Uh, yeah, as, as you said in the article, it's about holding the paradox of a payroll. Uh, yeah. Wow. When you hold the paradox, the, 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 then the border is there. <laughs> Sometimes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a koan, isn't it? Uh, the, you, you, it's a mystery. You, you face the mystery and you know you can't yeah, solve yeah. it. The mystery is there. You cannot solve it. There, there no. is a payroll. Uh -huh. 
I would say that for Anaximander, Apiron itself was not a paradox, but the things that it creates, like the dualisms, they are paradoxes, oh, because oh, dualism yeah. is always oh, yeah. uh -huh. so. so uh, hmm. Wow. Oh. Not half bad. <laughs> Maybe it's time to wrap up here. Uh, uh, do you have anything to add? No, good talk. Oh, a yeah, very good talk. <laughs> I you, hope Hans. the listeners like as well. Thank you very much, yeah. chaps. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. a nice Thank evening. You. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.